Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Coomber Bruggan. I'm the Director of Geological Survey Ireland. Unlike what it says in your programme or on my badge, but we won't take issue with that. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to day two of the conference. Um, I was kind of struck by the uh, slogan on the entrance there, innovators and disruptors welcome. So that's a theme for today. Fits with your conference. Uh, hopefully you're all uh, raring to go after last night's uh, enjoyable dinner. <coughs> um, the first session, so you shouldn't be asleep yet. Anyway. Um, you might be wondering why uh, a geologist is opening your uh, your conference, which is about university and healthcare stakes and innovation. Uh, quite simply, um, you guys have a big uh, energy issue, and uh, we think we might be able to help solve it. Although, as uh, Ronald Reagan famously said, the scariest sentence you can ever hear is, uh, "We're from the government, and we're here to help." <laughs> so, uh, hopefully, it won't be scary. Um, the energy solution we're talking about is, is geothermal energy and, and particularly the potential for deep geothermal energy and we're delighted to have this opportunity to meet you people who are the key stakeholders for our science and, and our expertise I guess. Um, that's going to be covered in these two morning sessions. Um, to start Stats are from Sustainable Energy Authority Ireland's 2022 report. Is that roughly one third of our, our energy consumption is on heat, one third is on uh, one, yeah, one third is on transport, one third is on electricity. But the the problem with the, the heat side is that it's uh, or um, is that it's almost completely from fossil fuels, 94 percent fossil fuels, and that's the hard nut to crack. Um, so over the last few years, uh, te with technology changes and sort of better understanding of the subsurface, we've moved from a situation where geothermal energy was something you all just understood in Iceland to the potential to apply it here, here in Ireland. Some of you have probably been on those expensive holidays in Iceland and you, you, you pay a fortune to get there and then you pay a fortune to lounge around in the Blue Lagoon and you didn't realise you were in the cooling pond for a geothermal power plant. I guess the, the name Blue Lagoon sounds a bit better. <laughs> um, but that's the reality. Um, and we know from Iceland, and you've seen the geysers in Yellowstone, and maybe you've seen the situation in New Zealand where they produce electricity from this. We're talking about a different, a different level of geothermal energy here, lower temperatures, but enough probably to, to power district heating systems here and maybe to sort out your, your, your carbon issues and your, more importantly, your, your energy bills. Uh, my own background as, as a geologist, I'm a resource geologist, I worked in oil and gas and mining, and I guess I got an appreciation for you know, the value of geothermal energy when one of my first jobs working on a, an oil rig in the North Sea, freezing winter, uh, somewhere northeast of the top end of Scotland. When you've been taking drill cores and uh, you actually really appreciated that the drill mud was really warm and the cores coming out were nice and toasty when it was absolutely freezing. We were drilling down to 2,000, 3,000 metres and this was hot fluid coming back. It's cold fluid going down. Simple enough. The irony of appreciating geothermal while you were drilling an oil and gas hole isn't lost on me. <laughs> but it's the same technology. It's the same technology, it's the same drilling, it's the same expertise and crucially it's the same we have the same scientific expertise to understand the subsurface that we can now apply to geothermal here. Um, in Northern Ireland, uh, Mary Cowan is here and she's going to be, be on one of the panels later on. They've really done an amazing job on raising awareness about this. They ran a geothermal week last year and uh, they're really pushing ahead, pushing ahead on this uh, to the extent that there's going to be a seismic survey done fairly soon and be an opportunity for people to go and see, see what, what that involves. Um, I was lucky enough to, to go to the Netherlands recently uh, with our, our equivalent organisation, Geological Survey of, of the Netherlands, and look at some of these geothermal facilities they have. They don't have volcanoes and geysers, but they have large parts of their cities now being heated by, by geothermal energy. We were in The Hague and a, a small barn-like building, kind of trendy looking, 
uh, wasn't a, a restaurant or a coffee shop. It was uh, surrounding the wellheads and pumping station for a deep geothermal system, which was heating all of the, the municipalities' uh, apartment blocks in the whole area. We also went to another area where the local uh, glass house owners, the vegetable growers, huge, huge business, uh, global leading business in the Netherlands, had tapped into geothermal energy to displace their gas bill for these hectares of sometimes two and three and four storey glass houses. And they've been so successful at it that they're also selling the heat back into the, the flower market, the world's largest flower market, and trucks coming in and out and back into the city. And now we've set up a company to do geothermal energy for other, other people in the same business and making almost as much money on the geothermal energy side as they were on the, on the, on the, the growing side. It's a big old Dutch well organized. Um, so, so here in Ireland, with Geological Survey Ireland, we've been working on the research side of this and the data gathering side for a good few years now, including working with our department, Geological Survey Ireland are a division of the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications. So working closely with them, not just on the data side, but also on the policy and legislation side. So in 2020, we managed to produce sort of two linked pivotal documents, a geothermal roadmap for Ireland on both what we need in terms of data and collaborations, and also what we need in terms of policy, legislation, regulation. And that's moved forward now. We have a geothermal advisory committee set up and our policy people hope to have a policy statement on geothermal before our cabinet, before the summer recess, which will be followed by developing the geothermal bill and regulations around this. This is one of the things that has hampered development in other areas. It's where the science can get ahead of the regulation and we're hoping to be able to keep, keep in step with that. We've lots of examples of things to follow with ORE and we've just had the res auction here very successfully on our offshore, but we're talking about something that is easier and quicker to deploy and an awful lot cheaper and an awful lot more local in terms of solutions. So we're very excited geologically about this and then one of the key steps is getting that information to bring it forward. We're really delighted to have worked with some of you here, particularly TUD, Mark Gardy here, on, on drilling a, a pilot hole out in Grange Norman, where at one kilometre we recovered 38 degrees centigrade water and modelled that if we go to two, two and a half kilometres, we're talking 60, 70 degrees water enough to run your district heating system. No gas, no electricity, maybe a small bit for a pump. So potentially a huge, huge saving. And just on the big picture, it's saved your energy bill, but you know, we're focused on this because it's a climate crisis, climate biodiversity crisis. And we're not just trying to lower the bills, we're actually trying to deal with a much bigger issue. And uh, it's kind of, I've just, just been away, uh, <coughs> I was getting slagged about it there, in Centre Parks last weekend for a big roundy birthday with my grandkids. And the thoughts that they will inherit uh, an Ireland that is worse off, is harder to live in, with less biodiversity than I grew up in is sort of both terrifying and, and shameful. So we need to do something about it. Um, like I said, we have the already plan to follow and uh, I'm delighted with the work that and the engagement we've had to date with several of the people in the room here, particularly the people on the hospital side. And I got to meet Alan Sharp last night, and Adele Weiss who's organized this. And we've had advocates like Stephen Cole from SDCC and the whole <coughs> Kodima team rolling in behind, behind trying to move this. Um, so I think uh, together, you know, innovators and disruptors, hopefully we can, uh, we can move the dial on this and get some more information. The next step for us is trying to organize a, a seismic survey in Dublin, looking underneath the city to optimize where it is we're going to need to drill uh, to make this, make this a success. You'll hear a lot more about this from uh, our own geological survey Ireland experts. Uh, Dr. Sarah Blake, Dr. Eva Braden, who are going to, mentor, uh, going to lead the two morning sessions. And hopefully we can, we can make progress on it. So thanks for the opportunity. And uh, with that, I'll welcome Sarah for the first session. Thank you. So, thanks, Kim. And uh, morning, everybody. And uh, just quick thanks to Eva.
Adele for dragging us along and for a great event last night. Uh, so I work with Kuhn uh, in the survey and I manage the geothermal program side of things. Uh, so I don't know how to work this, but I, I've just got a, a 10 minute slide deck to get us all, uh, ease us in this morning. Thank you. Uh, to kind of set the scene just in case there are some of you who may not be as familiar with um, the different terminology and, and concepts <coughs> of geothermal energy that we're going to be using. Uh, and then I'm going to invite, uh, we have six disruptors uh, for our panel discussion, so after this presentation I'll invite them down and we'll get going with a bit of a, a, a discussion. So, um, as Kuhn said, we are a direct division of DEC. Uh, but we behave more like an agency, so we're um, the national repository for geoscience data. Our main function is to make this data uh, openly available to the public and um, we have a wide variety of stakeholders. So our products, you can find them on our website, they um, deal with a diverse array of topics, so everything related to the subsurface. Bedrock, groundwater, seabed mapping, we also uh, look at natural disasters and public health risks, and of course now um, geothermal energy is a kind of a growth area for us. So uh, we've been around a long time, um, and this is a, a shameless plug. If you haven't seen the island, it's still available on uh, the RTE and possibly PBC players, and there's our director talking to Liv Bonner about rocks. So um, this is like covering the basics. So what is geothermal energy? It's commercially proven, it's in use in other places, it's renewable energy that can be used for heating and or cooling, so don't forget that, and uh, if you have uh, high temperatures you can actually use it for electricity production. The definition that we work with is that it's energy stored in the form of heat beneath the surface of the earth, so that's everything from the soil down to the core. Um, so heat flows outwards from the centre of the earth, and in general, on average, uh, the temperature increases with depth at a rate of 25 to 30 degrees per kilometre that you drill down. And Ireland is no different. The hole that um, we drilled uh, a year and a half ago in Grange Gorman, we got 38 degrees at the bottom, that gives you a geothermal gradient of approximately 28 degrees per kilometre. Um, so we're good, you know, we're, we're average, maybe slightly above average, depending on what position, uh, definition you're using. So while we're not in a traditional geothermal setting, you know, you, the places that can mentioned, Iceland and New Zealand, they're basically sitting on volcanoes. You know, this is where the heat escapes from the centre of the planet very easily. But nevertheless, we're more like the Netherlands and France. We can still tap into this resource using our engineering and our ingenuity. So the bubbles on the right-hand side of the screen there, these are the, the relative benefits of using geothermal energy. It's always on, so the heat is always there, 24-7. Um, you know, you're not dependent on the sun shining or the wind blowing, it's local and secure. So it's heat beneath your campus that you can tap into. You're not dependent on supply chain or market fluctuations. It's carbon free at source. So there is obviously this carbon footprint with everything. So with uh, geothermal installations, it's the drilling. So it's usually diesel driven rigs. Although there are some innovations towards electric rigs now. Um, and then of course steel, so steel casing for your boreholes with the carbon footprint associated with that. But in general, it's really, really low carbon option. Improved air quality, so you're not burning anything. And then the small land footprint. So the infrastructure of these installations is underground, which architects love. Um, so you don't have a big ugly box inside your building. And also now that the discussion about biodiversity is gaining more and more importance, you know, we could do other things with that land. We could wild it. We could, you know, use it to feed people. You know, it's a great uh, benefit. So I'm going to make these slides available uh, if, if I can circulate them, and you can. There are links to our general publications on geothermal energy. So uh, this is like the two end members of the scale. So on the left we've got Yellowstone National Park in the western coast of the United States. You can see the heat is just coming to the surface of its own volition. If you were to develop this as a geothermal resource you wouldn't have to drill very far at all. And the sort of flip side of that is the example on the right. This is from a project in Finland. So Finland is situated on the fenno scandian Shield, which is a very thick uh, piece of crust. It's very old and it's very cold. So they would be looking at a geothermal gradient of around 17 to 18 degrees per kilometre. And this particular project, um, they need to drill between six and seven kilometres 
to get the temperature that they need for district heating. And nevertheless, you know, drilling is very expensive, by the way. Um, so this type of deep drilling, um, it's you know tens of millions of euros for this project. Nevertheless, they're going for it because of where they're situated and who their nearest neighbours are. So this energy security is, is a big win. So how do we get the heat out of the ground and into your buildings? Well, it really depends on the application or what, what do you require the heat for? Not only how much heat, but how is your heating and cooling load spread <coughs> over here? And you also need to look at your site specific conditions as well. So all of this will influence what technology choice you use. And this diagram here shows um, a range of technologies. So we've got things like energy piles, you know, this is where you're collecting heat from within the fabric of your building. Or you can have um, a, a open loop boreholes, which is where you drill a pair of wells and you suck water out of one, you take a little bit of heat off it and you re-inject it into the other. And then this can be done at scale. So this can be done on a really deep scale, two and three kilometers. This is what we call a geothermal doublet. These are um, kind of uh, a traditional geothermal installation, let's call it that. Um, and then, you know, you can scale that up and go down four or five kilometres and you could possibly be looking at temperatures in excess of 120, <coughs> 150 degrees and then you're into the kind of temperatures you need to generate electricity. So really, we kind of think there's a geothermal, there's an engineering solution for every building and every geological situation. Um, so geothermal is particularly the deep stuff, the deep doublets that I mentioned, these are ideal for district heating networks. It kind of works both ways. So obviously it's renewable, secure, carbon free, but also the district heating networks unlock geothermal in terms of the economics of the project. So where you have a really high heat demand that's concentrated, this is what you need to make, you know, to justify drilling the deep multi-million euro doublet. So the two kind of work hand in hand, and there are a lot of developments at the moment on um, district heating policy. You know, it's we're really obviously our, we're behind the curve on district heating as with a lot of other things. But for us, we feel that we've sort of been hanging on to the coattails of the district heating movement because we recognise that this is this could be key for us to unlock this resource. And then just the last point: the the kind of twenty four seven nature of geothermal energy means that it's ideal for integration with other renewables. And as Kuhn mentioned, even with the deep doublet, you still need to pump the water. You still have a small electricity requirement. So, you know, what if you got that from solar? You could be completely self-sufficient on your campus. So what do we know about Ireland's geothermal potential? And this is where we're working at the moment. Um, so this is a picture from our web viewer. This is our looking at our shallow geothermal resources. Um, and you can see that it's mostly green or beige. The green is probably uh, is very suitable, and the beige is probably suitable more information required. So we do understand our shallow geothermal resources quite well, and for us there is very little geological risk in that we kind of we're, we're fairly sure we know what we're going to get when we drill. Shallow, by the way, is zero to five hundred meters. On the right hand side, this is a thermal model that was made uh, by researchers in the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies. This is a slice through the Irish crust at two and a half kilometres depth. And what it's showing you is the areas of Ireland that are hotter relative to others. So it's a model and, you know, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Um, so we are working with researchers on this and we are aware we need more data <coughs> to refine this model, but you can see the bullseye that is Northern Ireland, Mary Town, should be delighted. <laughs> um, so this is uh, directly linked to the Antrim basalts and the, the Giant's Causeway. So that ancient volcanic activity, there's still a remnant thermal signature within the crust. And we can also see the same down in Leinster with the Leinster granites, Galway granites. And actually, even in the centre of the country, you can see we're up above 60, 70 degrees. <coughs> So even in places that aren't red, we're still in the, the kind of um, temperature range for large scale heating projects and district heating projects. So um, geothermal is great and why hasn't it happened? So we know that 94, so let's look at shallow and deep. 
94% of Ireland is suitable for shallow GSHD, geothermal source heat pumps. Um, why has this not taken off? You know, um, so there are multiple factors, but in general, it's a lack of public awareness about the resource and it's a lack of policy support. So air source heat pumps are so much cheaper, yet they were, they're less efficient, they require more electricity to run them. Uh, however, in the short term, that's the option that most people go for. And the air source and the ground source heat pumps, they receive the same amount of support at the moment uh, in terms of grant support. So that's kind of what I mean by lack of policy. Um, and then on the deep side, this is from the European Geothermal Council, and you can see these are all of the deep geothermal installations in Europe as of 2020. Red is for heating and blue is for electricity. You can see there's absolutely nothing going on in Ireland because we, we haven't had a deep project yet. And in that case, it's again, it's this lack of awareness, it's a lack of policy support, but it's also a lack of data. So we never had an onshore oil and gas boom in Ireland, and places like the Netherlands and France, they did in the 60s and 70s. So as a result, they really understand their subsurface and they're really quite certain of what they get when they drill. That translates into lower project risk. So this is where we feel that we can help. We're the you know, National Geoscience Agency. Boring slide alert, but <laughs> who mentioned this? Um, but uh, we have to, you know, it's, it's, it's a really, really big development for the sector. Um, you know, we're going to get a policy statement before government, before the summer, and uh, as follows on from that legislation and regulation to, you know, <coughs> standardise the sector and, and make it more secure for investors. And just to say that our role in all of this is to provide technical advice and support into our policy makers within the department. So, um, you know, with everything, there's risks and considerations. So what, what might be the drawbacks or what must we consider with geothermal installations? Um, so again, separating it into shallow and deep. So with shallow geothermal, it's kind of the same as a water well. The, the construction of it is, is mostly the same. And as with any water well, you need to construct it properly. You don't want mixing of waters between different aquifers. <coughs> you don't want to interfere with, say, uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems. Um, so you just need to, you need to construct them and plan them properly. Um, with the closed loop systems, which is uh, also called borehole heat exchangers, um, there's an artificial fluid circulating inside a closed pipe. And you must make sure that there's no leakage. And then in terms of managing the resource, you know, you can think if tomorrow everybody in Dublin went out and got a, a ground source heat pump, um, it'd be chaos because, you know, you'd, you'd have interference between the systems. So we need to be cognizant of that going forward if we really want to do it properly. We need to manage these systems and understand how they interact and how they interact with the subsurface. And on the deeper side, it's, it's much the same. So when you drill, you know, two and a half feet from into the earth, the, the groundwater, or it's, it's not really water, it's a fluid, and it's full of um, dissolved material. So it's actually usually quite saline, and um, obviously you don't want to have contamination between that saline water and shallower aquifers. So again, well construction regulation is paramount. Um, the other big thing that you might hear of is induced seismicity. So these are like micro earthquakes or small movements of the ground. Um, and this could occur when you're injecting into the subsurface, you know, um, at high pressures. So this can be managed. You just need to be sensitive about it. You need precise management and robust monitoring of the situation as you're testing and producing hot fluids. Takeaway messages. It's everywhere. It's here. It's under Trinity. It's, you know, uh, it's extremely clean, secure, stable, economical. Deeper resources, you can, we can tap into it. We just need to come up with the capital expenditure to sink these boreholes. Um, you know, hand in hand with making these projects bankable is improving our geological knowledge to reduce that project risk. And that is where we feel that we can help. Um, we are slowly but surely building up the National Geothermal Database. Um, and we are, as Coon mentioned, exploring the potential for deep demonstrator projects in Dublin. So um, we have a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. So I think we will be there. So could I invite my disruptors?
to join me on the comfy chairs. So everyone has their own mic, and I think I'm going to allow the speakers to introduce themselves and jump right in with a question.
I suppose because we're also officials of government, we're very focused on supporting policy development, thinking and delivery. So it's slightly unusual relative to most geological surveys which are very focused on research. Um, and one of my roles is leading the Genome Advisory Committee for the department. So in terms of heat, I mean I think you obviously sort of give a brilliant preface, you know, this morning, Sarah. The, the prize is basically, certainly in Northern Ireland, 50% of our carbon is from heat. So therefore it can be the biggest challenge but also the biggest prize when it comes to actually succeeding in reaching net zero. Uh, and also there's a leader imperative which has focused the mind. Uh, and there's some brilliant leadership that you'll hear more about by some of the universities across the island uh, in Europe and globally um, who are leading by example and providing demonstration to society both on their campuses but also as a wonderful um, driver to changing behaviours, raising awareness and sharing learning. There's a beautiful example, um, the American Chambers each year through the Royal Ash Academy uh, gives a series of awards to American-based companies who have Irish uh, offices. And there's a lovely example of Microsoft uh, through the installation of renewable um, solar panels basically on schools, as well as decarbonising the student state. We're also able to use the, the uh, screens and the data portals of usage as a learning tool as part of the curriculum to raise awareness in the student community and that includes parents and grandparents, but also to help as a career pathway uh, to students. And so that's, I know in the audience today there are schools represented, uh, directors of the state and sustainability and also hospitals. So those are the two, the two non-negotiable parts of our lives, whether it be going to school or a hospital at some stage. And so they actually have a pivotal role when it comes to informing and changing society's perspective. And that's why we're delighted to take part in something uh, that's concerning, obviously, those of you who are gathered here today. Um, in, in terms of the local authorities, again, there are some local authorities represented, and uh, as well as central government, they are striving under the same economic pressures to manage their estates, to reduce their carbon, to fulfil their statutory and legal duties, uh, and I suppose before the world is ready to actually support them. So we would feed a, a, a number of inquiries from local authorities um, in, in, as part of their local area development plans and some of their policies, but also in terms of their energy action plans. And I know there's huge work, and Dublin is really lucky to have Kodima, but we need probably the equivalent of Kodima, certainly for Belfast or Antrim for Northern Ireland. So in terms of advancing geothermal here, you're ahead of Northern Ireland, and that's a huge key a role to play when it comes to the shared language between the science and the possibilities. Uh, so, so that's probably one of the things that maybe we'll touch upon later. But also on finance. So increasingly, uh, the banking sector and the insurance sector, I mean, just this week, Nat West announced their first green non percent mortgage. So increasingly, if we have, I mean, I know in Dublin there's a beautiful listed building, two and four or five story floors, but basically in the future on this, you can make those types of building energy efficient. You would pay for the privilege of generating carbon to occupy those buildings. So increasingly mortgages and insurance uh, policies will have a cost for your choice of life. So uh, there's the push and pull in terms of behaviour change, the legal imperative, but also a hip pocket. So hopefully we'll tease out some of those issues as part of the discussion today. Great, thanks Mary. And yeah, great that you mentioned the importance of the local authorities. They're one of the key actors in getting this whole thing going. Um, okay, so I'm going to move to a, a, a specific question and I'm going to ask it to Tiernan. And you introduce yourself first. But, um, what makes geothermal energy a good fit for the likes of hospitals and universities? Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Tiernan Henry. I work in the University of Galway. I'm a hydrogeologist, basically, the geologist who deals with water in the subsurface. And um, over the, la the, the last 30 years or so, I've been drilling holes various locations in and on Ireland and dealing with the problems associated with them. Um, uh, it, and thank you for inviting me today as well, Sarah. Um, it, I think there's loads of reasons why it works on campuses like universities and hospitals. From a purely academic perspective, it's really useful because it becomes a teaching tool. It becomes a source of information that can be used directly for teaching students. Because you can actually see the site, 
And it also becomes a source of data, a source of information for research. And that can be nationally funded and so on. So those are the kind of practical sites from our perspective, from the university perspective. Um, and there's a knock-on as well there, is because it's university, or because it can be a hospital campus as well, I guess, one of the other aspects about it is we can talk about it. It doesn't have to become proprietary. So we can actually use it as a demonstrator project. You know, we can invite people on site to see how the system physically works. And you know, the, the physical infrastructure, everything from the holes to the ground, to all the piping and all the cable and all the network. And you know, literally the, the, the fencing around the site. Um, I suppose there's a couple of other big aspects as well moving into the kind of the, the, the hospital side of things. It's the size of the campuses. Generally speaking, you have a relatively large footprint, which basically means you control the campus yourself. Um, so frequently you'll only have to talk to yourselves. Your neighbours aren't necessarily going to be necessarily too disrupted by the, these activities. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's, it's a real positive, you know, not to have to... You'll still be planning permission, but it all basically means you're doing it on your own, entirely on your own site. And again, from a university perspective and a hospital perspective, is there's a constant draw on energy. You know, and I was thinking about this coming up this morning, certainly with the hospitals, you know, they need heat and cooling 24 hours a day. So if you have a source that you can tap into immediately underneath you, th these buildings, it gives you this constant input of heat and a constant hit input of heating and cooling uh, potential. And then it also allows you to start playing around with the heat and um, use buildings or parts of buildings almost as batteries. You can heat things at night and let them draw heat back off them during the day. So there's multiple uses of the heat that you can get from a single source in the ground. Um, and there's, a, there's a whole bunch of other things. Lewis is here who's, who ran the GFIT project for us and all. He talked about the, literally the nuts and bolts of how to do this. But there's lots of other potential things as well for university campuses as well. It's that kind of modular approach. Because again, as you're planning the entire campus, you can think in a modular way. So even though you might be just installing for one building initially, because of the potential of, of own, or because of the ownership of the campus, that opens up this potential that you can add buildings on or that the, the scheme itself can be increased. You can increase the capacity of the screen of, of the scheme and you can get much more benefit out of it as well. That's great. It. That's yeah. great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, I think I just, Rick, would you have anything to add on that point? So good morning, everyone. I'm Rick Pascali. I'm a geologist. Surprise, surprise, another geo. You know? <laughs> um, uh, I've been working in the geothermal industry for about 20 years. Now, I'm the vice chair of the Geothermal Association, so we're, I suppose, an industry association representing the, the geothermal sector. In Ireland. And what I would say is, the first thing I would say is our association has been sort of um, logging the use of geothermal energy since probably 1997 when we were first founded. And our, our sort of typical, let's say, size of development has typically been mostly residential in the late 90s and the, and the 2000s, but more recently in the sort of a 100 to 300 kilowatt range in larger scale buildings, mostly for space heating and domestic hot water. Um, and I think what I would say to, to, to what Tiernan was, was just explaining a moment ago, the size of the prize here for, for geothermal as a whole, whether it's, it's shallow or deep, and particularly for hospitals and, and university campuses, is the technology allows you to deliver heating and cooling in a really, really highly efficient way and, and have an energy storage option as well in some circuits. So it's really beyond the boundaries of your classic um, boiler, air source heat pump, which is just a box that actually does one, maybe a second row, but, but not very well. So, so it's, it's, it's a much broader, broader and holistic view of, of what you can do with that, with that technology. And I think at a higher level from what we were, we were discussing beforehand, um, the second part of that, of that prize, uh, I think, is actually integrating the solutions that we know very well, like you've heard this morning, Sarah was talking about shallow 
um, geothermal systems and also the deeper options and how now you can integrate both of those solutions into a much, much broader scheme of you know, community level in terms of district heating. So whilst we've spent kind of 20 years developing individual systems in buildings or to deliver a, something to a building, you now have to look at that with that campus type perspective and then indeed that city perspective because if you move to the Netherlands or to Denmark, you know, um, individual, uh, let's say, shallow geothermal collectors also now play a role in the sort of much broader district heating and community heating and cooling options. Yeah. And I think we might talk about that maybe later on. Yeah, so I think definitely sure. <laughs> it's, it's really exciting that we're thinking about yeah, installing your system for your own building and then you become part of this wider fourth, fifth generation network. So, um, yeah, so I think we just have, uh, have another question now. We've moved to the hospital lads. <laughs> so, Vincent, I haven't actually met you. You're the only one I don't know, but you're very welcome. Thanks, uh, <laughs> Vincent from HSC. Yeah, and um, so I'd just like to hear from yourself and Alan um, in turn about um, the energy challenges that are facing the hospital sector in particular and how can we help? How can we deal with our energy health? Uh, I think let's start with one mention of about um, it, about fifty fifty in terms of, of the uh, thermal and electricity. In the case of the, the hospital sector, it's often um, nearly two thirds of the HSC overall. It's two thirds thermal, so we've we've a massive problem to to uh, to change that. Obviously, our our very useful solutions are, are what's there currently is gas or oil, to, to, and that's a very reliable source, but it's obviously huge problems from the carbon point of view, so we have to find a way of um, an alternative to that, but that brings the same benefits of, of gas as well, where it's, 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 it's reliable, it's easy to, to use our, our own staff, and um, maintain staff can maintain these systems. And so I think that there are kind of challenges that, that we need to, um, to, to, to solve with, with, with this. So the terminal definitely seems to operate this potential. Obviously it's a, a big investment uh, cost on right, um, Looking at the size of the rate there as well, and figuring out there's a lot of hospitals that we would not be able to get that <laughs> in. Um, so it's very big to idea to district heating or being able to tap into it the same way that we can plug in or we can apply for our, our, our gas connection that we can just get a, a, a geothermal connection of a of, of district system. I think that would be ideal for us. But, but I think we have to um, we have to play part in leading out in this as well. So certainly with the pathway problem that that we've underway I think there's potential to, um, to, to try something. I'm not sure it would be the full deep, deep solution, but maybe there's an opportunity there with some precise to the, the, the shallow, um, the shallow uh, system. But let's, let's find out more. That's, that's what we're here to see today. Yeah. I'd like to hear it. Yeah, thanks, Vincent. And Alan, could we hear from you about your particular energy challenges and where you see geothermal fitting in? Um, I'm Alan Chark, I'm CEO of the Manor Hospital. Um, background is I'm an engineer, but having listened to some of the engineers here, I think I might say I was an engineer. Um, <laughs> I'm also a chartered accountant, but my role as running a hospital is to try and lead the teams and find solutions. Um, if I take just a quick step back from just the whole energy issue, 10 years ago, nobody had an interest in, in carbon footprints, in energy savings, etc. It just wasn't part of people's daily business. Your job was to come in, make sure your hospital ran well, try to deal with the million other problems you had, and once the lights were on, the heat was on, nobody really cared. And I think this is just a, a position we were in. I just ran through some of the uh, SAI, and it's like 80% of our energies are imported, 46% is gas. And when you actually look at it, we pat ourselves on the back for how well we're doing on efficiency. But if you actually look at our consumption, it hasn't really dropped. So we're still consuming fossil fuels at a similar rate to we were 10 years ago. And most of the drops we have in fossil fuels happened actually 10 years prior to that. And I think over a 20 year period, I'm hoping I've got the data right, it's about 5.2, 5.3% reduction in fossil fuel consumption over 20 years. But none of that has happened in the last 10. So we've effectively set stationary while the population grows and we're consuming all of the materials that create all the problems for us. Uh, you go into a board of large, our hospital has about a half a billion in operational costs each year, so our focus is uh, how do we use the money as wisely as possible. Uh, plus our board has uh, a very strong social conscience, 
when it's about once we're caring for sick uh, of the country, how do we actually do what's right for the people of the country and all of the other aspects of our business. So we did an energy program about 2017, 2018 that produces carbon by about 77,000 tons during the life of it. But when you look at what we consume from the gas today, over say the life of a building, a 40 year life of a building, we'll consume something like about 140 million in gas for one hospital over the life of the building. So we're talking about a 14 million deep well. And the problem is, is we're talking about 40 million deep well. And I've no doubt that next year unless somebody is willing to step up and take the risk, which is one of the areas that we have not really dealt with. It's not what we're trying to do, it's about our approach to how we do things. And if the policies in the country don't actually align, then there's a reason not to do it. And I think that then requires the leaders that actually have some level of appetite for risk, take that risk on board, and somebody needs to build a demonstrator site. Because if you think about putting a 14 million investment in, what does it have to actually save in my energy costs? And even if I capitalize that over 25 years, there's a couple of investors in the audience who manage big, big funds. They'll give you money at four and a half, five percent And even at that, the payback period, it, it, or the payback, it meant that the reduction you need to get to pay it back is actually not huge. We know from TU uh, what's under the ground. We know that that should be the same. I think the survey we've been looking for for Dublin is, is key to this because it gives people confidence that the energy is there. You know, they just won't move without that knowledge. But I think for us, the goal is, to my board, is to be as sustainable and as green as possible. The other side to all of this is, you know, some of you might have seen last night on the TV some of the health inside the hospital programs. Some of those new technologies we're putting into patients are funded. So there's another side to the energy saving in health where we get to actually help use some of that saving to actually advance clinical care for patients and provide a different social goal. So that's part of the motivation we use when we're talking to our own internal engineers who are the brains behind delivering these solutions for us about why we're doing it because that may free up a million euros, that million euros may allow us to run cancer programs that aren't otherwise funded. So there are benefits other than the carbon that the capital that's associated with running these type of programs do. But also, uh, and come back to the opening speech, it's about grandchildren and future generations and making sure that it's right. So we can do multiple uh, positive things from just doing the right thing, and I think that's the key message we need to go. There needs to be an element of bravery in the system where somebody says, okay, you know what, we found a location, we think it works. We've got nine level four hospitals similar to mine, so when you hear the money I'm talking about, that, that's as many, many multiples of that uh, in just the nine hospitals, of the big hospitals, and before you step down into the other 40 smaller hospitals, and before you step into the community. So there are huge, huge benefits here. And it's disappointing <coughs> that Ireland, with all of its intellectual capacity, and is seen as a leader in technology and pharmaceuticals and many other areas, when it comes to doing the right thing for ourselves, we're the last ones on the queue. So I think we need to change that approach. There needs to be an improved appetite for risk. And we need to be looking at what others are doing and not waiting to be at the, the, the bottom end of the ladder of the curve. We need to be the early adapters and we need to move into that space. So that's where I hope the people in my hospital actually are driving to. And I think we've demonstrated in the past, but for us, it's about taking the risk. It's about trying to demonstrate to others. And even in the energy project we did in the past, we handed over board papers, every communication to others so they get the benefit of a reduced time frame to deliver and a reduced uh, mitigation of risks. So knowledge transfer actually is hugely important. So people understand the risks and it's more, it's more important for us in our business to tell people where all the pitfalls are and to be open and honest about it so that they can avoid them. And I think sometimes when we're in the public side, nobody wants to talk about the half a million that you know, could have been saved if we could talk a different direction. 
But that's learning. That's a half a million of learning that can be deployed for everybody else who's going to do it. And it's just a different mindset. And I think that's where we need to get to if we're going to be successful. But for us, in the geothermal, uh, our, we're, uh, we've been not, um, designated for trauma building. Our intent is to put geothermal into that building. As in, we have a 5,000 square meter footplate. We're not sure whether we'll be able to get deep or into it, but our parent company owns Temple Street. And as part of Temple Street, if we don't get deep bore onto the Matter campus, we're intent on doing something in Temple Street to support the wider areas. Well. And there's a huge amount of social levels in around us. So not alone can we deal with the hospital's problem, we can help deal with some of the other problems, the inner city problem as well. That's brilliant, you touched on so many things there, but you're definitely speaking our language, you know, we're the geoscience data agency, you know, we're all about open and available and let's level everybody up together, you know, um, and again, that comment about, um, I think Tierney made a comment that, you know, the benefits of having the, the public sector buildings leading the charge is that it's not proprietary, the data is not, even it's owned by the state, it's owned by the people, so, um, yeah, I think this is, you guys are where it's at, you know, um, so yeah, just, just a little bit of background, something Alan touched on there, the 14 million euro. So this is work that we've done with um, TU Dublin in their Grange Norman campus. Um, we, at the basis of our test that they drilled, we, we did a costing exercise. And yeah, that's the current, so as of uh, 2022, uh, it would cost 14 million euro to install um, a, a geothermal doublet. Um, and that's it, everything included. So that's kind of the cost. Um, I guess the, the uncertainty there of what you get in return, it's uh, we're, we're, we're working with a really wide range of values, but anywhere from you know five megawatts to twelve megawatts. Um, so the more knowledge we have of the subsurface, that um, as economics become refined and easier for the bankers to work with. Um, and to that end, you know, how do we find out more about the subsurface? What we really need to do now in Dublin is uh, a deep seismic survey, so this is geophysics to actually, it's kind of like a, an x-ray of the ground, you know, you want to look <coughs> two or three kilometres below the surface and see what's there, and uh, this will help us target our drilling. So, you know, you can drill in a straight line down, or you can angle it, and you can, you know, from, from a, a well pad in Dublin City Centre, you can uh, target your drilling to, to tap into the most productive uh, geological structures. Um, so that's that's just the background, and that's that's what we're working towards. We're hoping for, um, and this is what we see as being the next step for Dublin is getting this um, seismic survey. So um, yeah, I think so. We're uh, I might we've introduced all of the panelists now at this stage. I'm just wondering, are there any questions from the audience at this point? Oh yeah, Alison, we've had earlier. Thank you, that's been really interesting. Um, I love the, uh, the six destructive thing. And just on that note, I have no plan today to make a dramatic exit. Yes. <laughs> um, and just, just in terms of, sort of healthcare, um, a key thing is resilience um, and sort of, you know, what is this sort of good practice in terms of backup for the systems? You know, what goes wrong? I'm sure what things that potentially go wrong. You know, we talked about other systems. Is it worth sort of introducing find air source, backing up some of the ground source? If anybody had any thoughts on that, maintenance aspects, lifespan, yeah. I think I'll direct that to Rick as said yeah. with the Yeah, so so I think I mean mostly to, to answer your question, you know, all all of the certainly the ground source side uh, on the on the shallower type of projects are designed to a specific demand. So depending on what what type of technology solution you decide to put in the ground. So for example, if you look at closed loop systems, they're very low risk, they're very um, easy to model and predict based on, on having an energy demand defined on the surface. So in terms of backup, very often uh, there isn't one. Um, you know, that's the, 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 there is one uh, out of safety, but it's not really for the use. That's, that, that's really the, the practicality of it. Uh, in terms of Larger systems, uh, where particularly there are open loop systems, you may need a backup just to cover maintenance periods and, and, and things like that that you, that you might have to install. But generally, they constitute quite a small portion of, of the operational time of the system. So it, it's not it's not really a risk, and it's generally an off the shelf off the shelf solution. Take the 
uh, B cells, chief exec, i.e. Really basic question, so who actually owns the heat in terms of where you read it from? Uh, just to bring my cynical head on, that at some point, hopefully not, but forgive me for the government people in the room, is there likely to be a taxation on this in the future? Okay, this is actually a big question, <laughs> and uh, that's why we really need legislation in the area and our own uh, policy statement. Um, you know, we, we have that process in training. Um, there's been no mention about taxation. I'm just looking to the future. Yeah, so I haven't come across it. Um, I think, uh, I know RIP has worked in other jurisdictions, so you perhaps put us in on the situation elsewhere. <laughs> Yeah, if you've got if you've got about an hour, yes. <laughs> so in, in simple terms, I think the, the ownership issue varies across many different jurisdictions. Um, um, it's not worth going into right now just to, uh, just to answer that. The model on how that is exploited in different jurisdictions varies as well. Um, so it's generally going through through licensing, um, um, and th those licensing uh, options that say are to the end user or the operator of the system and they cover a certain period of time and they vary based on deep geothermal solutions or shallow geothermal solutions but, but they also have a correct and commensurate you know data um, data submission requirement so so that the information that's actually being derived from those operating systems goes back to the regulator or to the government in order to be able to um, better improve policy, I suppose, in, in spatial planning and subsurface planning. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, well, I, I, I think it probably does in the fact that it's, it's quite an open question. And, um, and, and when, I suspect, if, and I'm not, but if I was a, an investor at the other side of the loop, I would be wanted to make sure that my risks are covered going forward <coughs> and uh, that's probably something Alan may, may be able to throw some light on. Yeah, I'm probably loud enough anyway. <laughs> uh, I, I might actually take that, I mean, as we mentioned, working with our colleagues on the policy side, there's actually a GSM policy division and a geoscience regulatory office and they're the same people who are licensing mineral exploration and uh, oil and gas although that's been bad now so they're just managing the wind down so it's the same basic idea the state largely owns the resource under the ground uh, Paul Getty said the meat shall inherit the earth but not its mineral rights <laughs> um, <laughs> so essentially you license it like the plan is you license it like abstraction for water there's no plan for taxation at all because the whole idea is to encourage, encourage the move to meet the targets. And uh, the licensing is just essentially to prevent, as I said, cross, you know, uh, interference of, of different systems. It's, it's, it's quite likely that you're, that's going to be, you know, the least, the least of the issue, but you do absolutely need clarity on it. Uh, and essentially get a license, you know, up to a certain heat level or, or over a certain footprint, and you know, Sir would say it'd be a good problem to have now if we had deep geothermal systems interfering with each other. But it's quite likely, from a district heating perspective, there's going to be larger, well spaced systems. And in terms of getting to the question of the, the backup, the whole idea is with district heating and these great initiatives now uh, from district heating taking offtake of heat from data centres here in Tala. Uh, from the waste energy plant that you probably hear about the buildings then that you'll have a district heating network and geothermal will be another node on that, another source on that. So it might well be if your geothermal system needs to be uh, worked on for whatever reason or more likely your waste energy plant needs to close down, you'll have the back of the geothermal. So the Nirvana situation is we're all on district heating, we've got lots of different supplies and uh, and this is, is just one thing. So and the whole idea then is abstraction license essentially around that. And there's actually abstraction licensing on groundwater, it's just come into force this year in the EPA, Department of Education, 
So that would be key part. It's it's said in the in the in the, the roadmap document already, and it's a sort of relatively straightforward uh, aspect. Okay. I think if um, just go back to a question that was asked a little earlier. Um, in respect to redundancy, most of the big hospitals already have redundancy. And for us, we, with the energy project we did we previously, we had four major boilers that fed the hospital. Three were always operational and one was here contingency. We're now down to about one and a half boilers, maybe up to two during the winter because of what we've already done, tearing the insulated buildings, etc. So that redundancy would actually deal with the hospital anyway. It would form your N plus one and allow you to be very comfortable with whichever solution you pick. Um, I've no doubt that the government will tax us anyway on something if they can, um, after they've really got everybody to do it. So that's fine. Uh, on the risk side, you know, I just was being rude, I just did a quick calculation on my phone there, um, and I do apologize for my phone going off here earlier on. We run a hospital can't fix the phone. Uh, but it's, it, the quick calculation is 1.2 million if I capitalize over 15 years, and 14 million at a rate of about 4.6%. That's, that's what it costs me. My budget is 500 million. I'm going to be 600 million in four or five years with the opening of the Toronto building. And if nobody comes with us, my board might decide that the hospital will do this on its own if we can meet the regulatory requirements. And it won't be the first time we've done something on our own because, you know, somebody has to lead. We have a very quiet board. They're willing to actually take that risk and move forward. Because, you know, energy security, when the Ukrainian war commenced, that was a real concern for us. What's going to happen with the gas? And that concern's gone over. So how are we going to heat our hospitals? What are we going to do in that regard? You know, there are other concerns for us into the future, whether you know supplies will be there. So we do somebody has to take the risk, somebody has to move forward. And what you're looking at for a hospital of my scale is you're looking at a fraction of one percent of my operating cost. Like if that's not a risk we're willing to take to do the right thing, we might as well not have these type of conversations. So, you know, that's how we will deal with the risk. But we'll go into it with our partners in health, we'll see whether we can get that support. But ultimately, we're a voluntary hospital, we're funded by government, but where we have a, a degree of autonomy as a separate legal entity, and as such, my board are obligated to meet a number of other requirements that sometimes others forget. And that's what we'll do when the board will take that decision in the round. And we have huge environmental requirements now coming into our balance sheets where we actually have to report on those part of our new reports. So there are things we are now being legislated to do. And this is where the conflict and the roadblocks tend to happen in, in respect to how things move forward. When there are policies or things that conflict, most people stop. But our board have a tendency to say we will actually deal with what are reasonable policies and what are considered, and we'll move forward in that direction. And even if the conflicts with one, we have to consider a greater good in the decision. That's how we deal with this. Thank you. Jim, did you want to add something? Yes, yeah, just it, in, in terms of the cost thing that we've been talking about, um, I'm again based in the University of Galway, and we have this thing called the GFIT project, which has come in under. 1.5 million in total and um, in terms of output but that's all about it. it's a demonstrator project but the practicality of it is, is what, it's, what we're using for is we're going to heat the swimming pool um, in the University of Galway so in other words when we turn the system on we'll be turning off two gas boilers instantly and the saving is it's 400 megawatt hours per year and uh, we have so it's a shallow system, so that's the big difference between the systems that's been talked about. So we're talking about 150 metres depth, that's we've drilled 17 boreholes on a very small footprint in front of the engineering building, um, and they're roughly 11 metres apart, 150 metres deep, and the heat that's been extracted from that will be boosted by a system that's an air source and ground source heat system, and that will be used to heat the pool and instantly you can turn the, the gas fires, the gas burners off as well. But the other side of that, as I mentioned, is one of the best, one of the things we're also thinking about doing with this project is we can use the pool itself as a battery. So we can heat the pool when it's cheap to heat the pool and draw heat back off it to heat other buildings on the campus as well. 
but it's the one source of heat that's being used. But it can be done at a significantly cheaper cost than you know, sort of 14 million. And again, Lewis will talk about this in the next session. He's <laughs> Yeah, and, um, I just wanted to add, particularly in, in terms of universities, to build on what Terry was just saying, um, th there's actually a 200 uh, kilowatt uh, easy system in, in Trinity College, uh, which has just been uh, integrated into the refurbishment of the Rubrics building, which is just a, a little bit further up. So there are 20 floor rows there below U Square. It's a completely low visual impact system. The plant room is subsurface, the floor is subsurface. So effectively, you don't see anything, which is not a great selling point for, <laughs> for our shadow technology. Um, but, but that is an example of providing uh, about 430 megawatt hours of, of heating and domestic hot water uh, to a historical building, which technically speaking, you know, um, to demystify this idea that old, old buildings can't, can't have uh, heat pump solutions. So that's one of them. But, but I also want to highlight there, there are many other examples uh, um, Queen's University New School of Management, it, that, that's a new building again, that's, that's a ground source heat pump system. Uh, there are probably other iconic places like uh, the Cliffs of Lower Visitor Centre, which mm -hmm. you, you, may, you may know or have seen on slides, that has a 165 kilowatt horizontal array doing heating and cooling simultaneously to, to the building. So it's actually, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the, it's easy to get. Especially as a geologist, when you get a bigger board, it's easy to get <laughs> fixated on the big, deep projects. But you know, it's this idea of the there being a solution for your campus and for your needs. Um, even Vincent, with your sites that perhaps don't have a lot of land available, there, there are probably still solutions that you could integrate into your your energy system on that site. Um, yeah, and that we, we kind of tend to think of the shallow geothermal stuff as plug and play, you know, we, we understand the shallow subsurface quite well, I think that's true in the north as well, um, so we're confident what we'll get, um, we shouldn't forget deep. about it. How deep is it, when you say shallow there, how deep? So the definition in the new uh, legislation will be 500 metres, but what we, you know, practically it's probably not 200, and the material system at 150, that's very typical, um, yeah. So yeah, I guess just to say that the shallow stuff, you know, it needs the policy support as well. Absolutely, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and there are bigger scale projects. You know, you, you might be familiar with IKEA in back in London. That's a megawatt over a megawatt system. Uh, some industrial cooling examples. Um, um, uh, hotel and shopping centres, uh, Castle Troy and Limerick. Aslone shopping centre and, and uh, uh, you know so there are larger larger sized <coughs> systems I think as I was saying beforehand I think the size of the price for us is trying to understand on a broader scale in terms of community energy if I want to call it one for a better word but this district heating network is one of the mediums to deliver that is how do you integrate all of that uh, there was a question of yours that I missed. I'm sorry, I haven't been back to you. That's okay. Um, yeah. um, Helen Byron, I think that was a great presentation. Um, uh, I suppose what I'd say is I attended an event last week in Cork and it was, it was excellent in that I brought all the public sector bodies in Cork City and County together and was brainstorming how to get Cork to climb with uh, Carbon Zero, etc. Um, but I'm curious, there was two things that struck me. Number one, geothermal was not discussed, it was not a topic that came up any stage during the day. So um, my question is, you know, you know, sitting here from the HSB, I'm like, I'll take three, please. Um, <laughs> I have one in Galway, one in Cork, and one in Waterford. So if we do our own thing on our own site, that shallow retrofit from, from our shallow, uh, um, from what I understand. But who is the Kodima in... Galway, Waterford and Cork um, promoting this concept to the CEOs of public sector bodies in those locations because from what I gather from your map the potential is in the west of Ireland, you know, the south and the southeast um, because for example there was no SEAI presence etc at the events that I attended in Cork and I know it was just one event but I'm just wondering who is promoting this 
as you know, the silver bullet to the public sector bodies in this state outside of Dublin. So I feel like this is where we have our work put out for us. So we are dealing with a number of councils quite well. You know, we have great relationships with the Dublin councils, with Codina, and we're also working with Sligo County Council on a project. Uh, I've been speaking to Waterford City Council and they were very receptive. But as, as it happens, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a networking thing, it's a word of mouth thing. You know, we need to ramp up. We, Geological Survey, you know, we need the resources to be able to ramp up and get the message out. And, and that is, you know, the, the three barriers I was talking about, the awareness is number one. You know, raising that awareness and also, like, how do we help the councils to, to access the information. So like Stephen is in the audience, Stephen Cove, um, you know, I, I've been, he's come to me several times with, with project specific locations and we've been able to give information, you know, based on our maps and our data holding. But like how do, how do we roll that out and make that available to all the councils? And also it's about finding your person in the council. You know, who's who's gonna take it on, who's who's open to it? Um, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. Can I just add that? Yeah. Yeah. And how does that, you know, it, it is also important to say SAI, the National Authority, and, and I suppose that it, we're kind of up against it as well, I would say. Sometimes it's a bit of a and egg. You know, someone comes to you and says, I've got an idea for you on a project. Who can support me? How am I going to do this? And we're kind of not quite, you know, we're kind of saying, stay in touch, keep talking to us, but we don't necessarily have an answer as yet, I suppose, or kind of like, you know, that's why we're really excited about looking at different projects and demonstrators when we say, look what they did and have a case study, and then that hopefully informs some sort of funding stream or mechanism. I suppose I would encourage people to look through the PATH funding program and, and to engage our, with colleagues in SAI to, to deal with the public sector and decarbonisation. Um, then also that we recently launched um, at the uh, Energy Ireland Show um, this repeating candidate area which I suppose is a kind of a spatial analysis of if we're to reach, say, our targets of 2.7 terawatt hours for district heating, where is the greatest heat demand? Where makes sense? And just to say that, that is, it's quite a sophisticated piece of spatial analysis, I think, because it's noted on the local anchors being public sector bodies, that they will be the anchor tenants, they are where you would look to start your district heating schemes, they will be your biggest client, and then you build out from there. Um, so that, you know, just to, to encourage people to look at that as well, that's an initial step. We want that spatial analysis to inform heat decarbonisation and then to encourage people you know, to reach out, I suppose, and um, engage with local authorities and there will be, hopefully, a, a raft of feasibility studies being done coming down the line and we're looking for people, I suppose, to be the early adopters and to look to lead that charge. Would you have just, um, I'm not going to speak for the Irish on the there. Uh, but in Northern Ireland, there's an absence. And I actually disagree with that. I don't actually think it's the role of the geological surveys, but that's what we're doing in the vacuum. But we will want to hopefully there's a new horizon and a new world that we can have a word, right? But, um, so there, uh, there are recommendations in the GNRO vision document uh, as part of the Northern Irish policy um, support, which includes a one stop shop. But it's not just purely GFM, it's for the whole renewable energy picture. So I can interface as either a house owner, a business owner, a local authority, a sustainability manager, a CEO, whatever it happens to be. And I can have the sort of like consumer council, which equivalent of, you know, these are the costs, this is the payoff time, this is the life cycle analysis, you know. And, and there are some, there's some brilliant examples of non government organisation uh, data at the minute, but certainly GFM is included in that. So we actually probably need something like a shared services to interface with, to support local authorities and health trusts, but speak a common language. So whether you have planning capabilities, whether you have subservice capabilities, whether you have business case capabilities, you know, in terms of being able to speak to the boards. At the minute, we don't have that, you know, and um, we will keep on coming on until all of that is implemented. But it's, you know, this isn't rocket science, you know, the rest of Europe have been doing it for four years, we're learning, you know, thankfully we now have, a, you know, an imperative to do that. So if this is, in terms of risk, yes, there's some things that we don't know about the surface, and we're actually actively working to de-risk that. But in terms of assurances, it's basically rolling out what is already, you know, happening very, you know, and very successfully in terms of green economy, reducing and protecting the environment, stable jobs. In other parts of the world. So 
we will we will catch up as we have done, um, and the risk is probably is, is being managed. Uh, but you know, we would actually be full time staff just answering the likes of your questions. To be honest, we refer to consultancies, you know, which is ultimately appropriate. You know, trade bodies. But it, you know, before that idea horizon happens, the survey will keep. Uh, and we were joking earlier about you know serving the wagons and all this we could keep until until that stage. But thanks very much for for helping us make the case for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One more question. No, I, I'm Miss Rosie Webb. I'm the head of decarbonisation at TU Dublin, but I was previously the head of climate action and innovation in Limerick Council. Um, and what I would say to that issue about how you engage local authority. I think there's a, a very good opportunity. I know in SEAI you have a new board member who was the previous Sligo manager, Kieran Hayes. He also was involved in writing the guidelines for local authorities and what their role is in climate action. And it is certainly true to say that they that it isn't it isn't envisaged at the moment that local authorities have a role in, in becoming energy parts of energy communities, energy local energy <coughs> companies. I think that needs to be addressed and, and looked at in terms of the overall public service, but certainly the route through is, is through local government management agency, who is all of the local authority managers. So I think between Sarah and me, you could get together in your organizations and, and target that group. But also just to say, the, a lot of the local authorities, they don't have Kodimas. There are a number of them. Tipperary has one. There's a three agencies, one in Waterford. And I know in the West they've just set up an energy bureau. So that I think is the route through as well. So I think it's maybe late to the game, but those, uh, you know, those, those, um, let's say, committees are being set up, those, those places to access them. But I think the sooner you can target that, you know, the idea that local authorities have a role in, in energy communities and setting up global energy uh, generation and distribution. And I think maybe the place to start is a demonstration project. So, so the TU Dublin project at the moment doesn't have the local authority actively involved other than the chief code team, but I think it's very important in terms of setting out the actual roadmap. Thanks, Rosie. Yeah, you're, you're dead right. Uh, I think it's something we probably haven't mentioned here, but I think it does underpin everything. It's sort of a, it's not a lack of awareness, it's a lack of skill set. Um, whether that's key point deployment, um, wider key decarbonisation, but also then, um, you know, to your point, is that there, there's a kind of half mixed fabric, I suppose, of, of, of energy agencies are very lucky in Dublin. I think DEC was I just on Kodima and they've been really leading the charge and um, give yeah, good connection there. <laughs> um, and, and just to, to also add, you know, we are looking to local parties and the public sector, but they do need to be adequately resourced. And we can't keep kind of piling down on them the workload and say, you know, you 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 are now responsible for delivering, uh, you know, this decarbonisation challenge. You know, I think as a as a public, you know, in terms of value for money, you know, we need to kind of train up people, resource people. You can see, and we must learn the lessons from, say, offshore. Um, you know, they're currently. You know, they've had some issues around right planning and resourcing of that. So let's let's just look at to them and, and learn and not repeat those mistakes. But certainly, you know, we'd love to engage more with the local parties and to I, I guess encourage them to, to, to yeah take the leap as well as possible and, and be um, open to maybe um, looking at wider socio economic benefits of making of making this kind of project work. Sometimes it's quite salient as well to the person with the first things and that can be a challenge as well. Just um, not 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 to kind of labour on it, but in 2011, the state tried to do EPCs and the first one didn't get done in 2018, and it was done by voluntary hospital. The Dutch did a waste and water treatment system. It took six weeks to get approval in Holland. It took three years to get a license here. So you know, I, I think. The reality is that what happens on the ground is very, very different. And I think really if you what happens when the first project gets approved in this country is like Domino's people go fantastic. The risk now has been demonstrated, the deliverability has been demonstrated, and we can do it, somebody has to take them the first risk. So really if you're trying to move this forward, you know, you need 
a small number of sites and you're really needing and it's not about investment in my own field, it's not about going and putting it on the public sector and saying, you know, they need resources, etc. It's really about clearing away from a policy and legal perspective because there's enough there for us to go. I didn't our resources delivered the EPC contract in our hospital, but we bought all the expertise we need. There's a market there for expertise. You don't have to have it in house. And the fact is that if you think it's in your house, then you're in the wrong house. So you're better off going, buying the expertise in, making sure that the demonstrator sites actually function the way they're expected to function in line with how the international practice. So go to the jurisdictions that are actually doing it, that are doing it really well. Bring the scientists who know the geology from our country into the same room. Set out your plan. How are you going to go and do it? We turned around the EPC in one year. And we went out. The comment that came from the crowd when we were actually launching it was, this won't happen. And they rolled around and said, and all the contractors, and some of them weren't here, mm -hmm. so they were asked the same question. Like, are we wasting our time? <coughs> and that's the view, the commercial part of, 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 of our system we operate with actually views the public sector and what we're trying to do because it takes eight years to get a project running. It takes three years to get a license. So really if you're going to focus on getting this done and doing it, we need the policy position, we need the, the legislative pieces actually dealt with and dealt with very promptly, not sitting on this. And we need to start measuring this, measuring people by decision time and actually putting a cost associated with it that you cost X. I'm going to spend two and a half million on gas this year. So if you take a year to make a decision, and I can reduce my gas by half, fifty percent, you've cost me one point seven five million, and then you've delayed every other project by that year because it'll never be recovered because each one of those projects are going to wait for my project so they can see. And I'm not just saying me it could be done in Cork, it could be done in Gold, it doesn't really matter where it's done. But until that's done, everybody sits and waits. So there is a cost to, a f to the failure that we have in actually making decisions quickly. And we need to start pushing that cost out there publicly so people can be held accountable. Once you do that, you know, really, really positive uh, uh, potential solutions like the geotermal will actually move much quicker. And you will end up being hopefully in a position like you get in Holland where they can turn around the license in six weeks, where you have other parties who can turn stuff around quicker. And like there's a cost. Time has a value. And I don't think that's appreciated. I don't think that's where we need to get to. So uh, I did have a question around that theme, Alex, that you've introduced for me. But I was going to put it to yourself and Vincent. So, you know, what does your sector need from us? So in our capacity as you know, the holders of the data, but also say the policy side of the thing as well. What do you need from us to get going? Or what would be your most immediate ask? And you mentioned there the legislation and, and the policy statement, you know, it, it's delayed, a few things always are, and there is a sense of waiting at the moment, but um, would that be your biggest ask, or is there something more immediate that could for get you For us, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's starting point is the seismic survey that's done, that mitigates our risk. So then the risk associated with building, we're more, it's, it, our board will be more inclined to take that on board and actually take that risk and move it forward. <coughs> then you need that seismic report with the legislative and policy position so that we know we have approval or consent or we have a process to go through in order to be able to uh, <coughs> give a license to a party to put a hole in the ground and and extract the energy. So once you have those two pieces, getting it done doesn't have to be anybody else's responsibility to put it in ours. And we'll go and do that. But we can't move our board forward if the policy makers aren't going to tell us what the government's position is going to be on this. And if the information that should be there for, say, five or six million to be done, that five or six million covers, you know, whatever the population is in Dublin, two million. It also covers all the universities, all the big hospitals, all the big public bodies, you know, which imply about 14% of all employees in the country. So you'd have an enormous well uh, of opportunity to pull from, from one seismic report. Now, absolutely every other part of the country where there's benefit will want something similar, but 
to try out a seismic report, and I have clear policy. Yeah, you know, we'll we'll go and do what we need to do in order to put in place what we need to bring our carbon levels down. Make it sound so simple. Um, and the same question to Vincent. Then I say, if, I, I get the feeling that you're more focused on the plug and play, the shallow. So maybe you won't be waiting on a seismic report. But is there anything in the meantime that we could help you with? Uh, I suppose it's to understand the um, when, when we we've done with consultants that they they say they've done a comparison and, and say the air source is, is as efficient or, or as the geothermal and, and that's the kind of a it's a trend that certainly has to pull out and to understand that to, to, to really do the, 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 the comparison to make that decision and based on the on the uh, on the real data rather than is it just are they just rehash kind of vendor information that the who are trying to sell air source inputs. So I think yeah, um, you know that's not something we need to understand and, and make the, the correct decision. I think with that, so I, I, th I think definitely if we can get involved in more feasibilities and, and make the decision on that basis and, and put something in and see for ourselves. Okay, that's very astute. <laughs> <laughs> I can see we're twitching in the seat. <laughs> well, no, I'm not twitching in my seat, but, but I, I, I wanted to kind of come back to the point of awareness that we were discussing earlier on, on, on local authorities and, and the healthcare um, facilities. I think awareness is not just about local authorities and, 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 and the geothermal solution. It's about all folks involved in the development of the project bringing this as a holistic solution to make the project successful. So, like drilling a hole in the ground in, in a shallow situation, particularly, isn't is, isn't the only thing that, that you need to do in order to make that project successful. And more importantly, to make it more efficient in heating and cooling, which it is, than, than any other technologies, including air sourcing pumps that are there. Uh, and, it's, uh, and, and from my own personal project experience, we take Trinity as an example, it's a really complex, it was a really complex building. Um, the energy demand profile is highly dictated by the interventions that were done in that particular building. So it's, it's not a new build, it's not easy to predict on day one. But if if you don't have that interface where you're talking to every aspect, every design aspect up front in order to deliver the right geothermal solution, um, you're really going to miss out. So in terms of doing the feasibility, um, at desktop stage, yes, there's plenty of literature out there. I know many consultants reference and say, you know, well, the COP of an air source heat pump is the same as the COP of a ground source heat pump. But have you looked 50 years ahead, which is what, what we do based on current best practice in Europe in designing uh, ground source collectors? You know, the geothermal solution is there for the lifetime of, of the project, not just of, of putting the technology on, on the wall. Thank you, Rick. Um, okay, I've gotten the signal, so um, I don't have time, Stephen. Sorry. Well, sorry. Can I just say very quickly, oh, yeah, sure. uh, so on behalf of the local authorities, um, to follow up what's been said there as well, I mean, part of our new city development plan, and this is just for Dublin, we are more prescriptive about what we're looking for from an energy statement point of view. And part of what Rick is saying there as well is that we want people to stop looking at the initial costs and the lifespan costs and the carbon costs over a 50 year period. So we in Dublin, um, I can't speak for the other local authorities, but in our new development plan which was put into effect in uh, December, we are being more prescriptive and about on-site renewables such as geothermal. So we are pushing that and that is something new. Designers are now struggling with that, to be honest with you. We're struggling with it as well. I mean, I had a discussion with Rick yesterday about a particular site in the Docklands. But we are, we're getting there, and we are starting to make changes actually in Dublin. So I just wanted to say that on behalf of the local authority. So we are really we are trying to do something. Thanks, Stephen. No, that is that is really big progress. And down to you, I want to add. So um, anyway, I just want to do you want to thank my panel of consultants.